Man's long search for habitable planets in this galaxy was over. The explorer craft USS Palomino came about and headed for home. Instead of life, it had encountered only the cold vastness of space. Aboard the Palomino, Captain Dan Holland and his weary crew prepared for their long journey back to Earth. Vincent, the ship's all-purpose robot, worked silently at the control console when an ominous and frightening image began to focus on the scanner screen. He quickly alerted the captain and first officer, Charlie Pizer. Mr. Pizer, I think you should come up here. What's up, Vincent? The largest black hole I have ever encountered, Mr. Pizer. Hmm, let's have a look at it on the holograph. Vincent pushed a button and a swirling three-dimensional image lit up over the console. The remaining crew members, Dr. Alex Durant, Dr. Kate McRae, and reporter Harry Booth, watched in awe. Right out of Dante's Inferno. Yes, the most destructive force in the universe, Harry. Nothing can escape it, not even light. I had a professor who predicted that eventually black holes would devour the entire universe. Why not? When you can see giant suns sucked in and disappear without a trace? Give us some magnification, Vincent. Yes, sir. It's a monster, all right. A rip in the very fabric of space and time. But I picked up something else of interest. Let's see it. It hasn't moved since I first picked it up. It seems to be some kind of ship. But how could anybody be out here ahead of us? Enlarge again, Vincent, and let's try to identify it. United States, Space Probe 1. That's it. USS Cygnus. USS Cygnus. Its mission to discover habitable life in outer space. Same as ours. Signal that ship, Vincent. They were recalled to Earth 20 years ago. Their mission considered a failure. How that must have galled Dr. Hans Reinhardt. Reinhardt had the knack of making his own ambition seem like a matter of national pride. Why, he talked the Space Appropriations Committee into the costliest fiasco of all time and refused to admit failure. Ignored his recall. Maybe not. Maybe it never got through. That ship just, just disappeared. They've never been seen again. Dan, get us in close enough. Vincent and I could get aboard on tethers. To quote Cicero, rashness is the characteristic of youth, prudence that of mellowed age, and discretion the better part of valor. No sense leaving the story of a lifetime untold, Captain. I believe there is, Harry. And it's looking straight at us. I don't mind telling you, I'm a little concerned. Some of my brother robots were assigned to Project Black Hole, programmed to send ESP messages back from space probes. Oh, a grand experiment, the scientists thought. Also ancient history, Vincent. Not to me, Mr. Booth. Not this close. The heat in there melts types like me rather quickly. Picking up anything on the sensors, Charlie? Negative. But with all that turbulence out there, our signal might not make it in through. According to my instruments, it hasn't moved a centimeter since we first spotted it. But Alex, how can a lifeless derelict defy that kind of gravity? I don't know, but it's certainly worth investigating. My instincts are against it, Alex. But we'll go in for a closer look. Picture coordinate approach, Charlie. Full power on the thrusters, Vincent. Strap yourselves in. We'll be feeling the gravitational force right now. She's bucking like a Bronco. Gravity pull. Point zero, two, four, five, zero, and rising. Captain, I'm not sure how long the engines will remain operable against that much force when we turn back. Alex, gravity's close to maximum. We can afford one pass, and then we're going to have to get out. Zero gravity. Smooth as glass. It's like being in the eye of a hurricane. What happened? Natural phenomenon. Or something from that ship. Activating the microbeam. Picking up anything, Charlie? Negative, Alex. No way our signals can't get through this time. Reverse thrusters and look for a place to set down. Despite the fierce power of the black hole, the Palomina was able to maneuver unmolested within the Cygnus's calm surrounding atmosphere. Then, without warning, the darkened ghost ship sprang to life in a blaze of lights. What's going on? That's what I'd like to know. 
Locking warheads into firing position. Hold it, Dan. They've got to be friendly. They could have blasted us right out of the sky. You got a picture down there? There are people on board. Just a shadow, Kate. Enlarge, please. There are people, Alex. I know it. I feel it. Docking elevator coming up. Wonder why they didn't roll out the red carpet earlier. I don't know, and I don't like it. Captain Holland set the Palomino down on the Cygnus' docking elevator. The crew stepped through the connecting airlock and into the Cygnus. They found themselves in a brightly lit corridor, but still no one appeared to greet them. Looks like we'll have to go to them. This place looks as if it hadn't been used for years. It's eerie. I feel like a thousand eyes are watching us. My senses have me on red alert, Captain. Vincent and Captain Holland led the Palomino crew into the abandoned main corridor of the vast silent ship. The door slid open in a cylindrical tunnel, where a high-speed air car awaited them. Obviously being maneuvered by some unseen force, the crew stepped into the air car and allowed themselves to be whisked away. The car traveled down the entire length of the signals, but still Vincent could catch no signs of human life. I don't like it when somebody else pulls the strings, Captain. Neither do I, Vincent. But who's ever up in that control tower is calling the shots right now. Whoever. Or whatever, Captain. At the end of the tunnel, the crew was greeted by a waiting elevator, which took them to the top of the ship. The doors parted to reveal a massive domed observatory, studded with lights and computers. Telescopes scanned the darkened sky, while astro screens continuously monitored the looming black hole. Mysterious silhouetted figures silently operated the huge banks of computers. Incredible. It ought to be. Sure cost the taxpayers enough. Hello? They appear to be some sort of robot, Dr. Kate. Kate. Yes? There's someone else with us. Don't move. From an overhead command console, a huge shape hovered above the crew. A mechanical monster. The image of immense power moved threateningly toward the group. A red light pulsed from the robot's sight panel, as if it were an angry warning. Identify yourself. What is your type and model? This is the story to end all stories, Harry. A ship of robots and computers with this thing in charge? Not quite, Dr. Durant. Maximilian and my robots only run this ship the way I wish it run. How do you know my name? You were monitored ever since our sensors first detected you. From deep in the shadows of the command center, a bearded figure stepped into the light. Welcome aboard the Cygnus. Hans Reinhardt. It can't be. You always did have a flair for theatrical entrances, Doctor. What happened when your mission was recalled? The Cygnus encountered a field of meteorites and was disabled. Our main and auxiliary communication systems smashed. We were adrift. I told the crew to abandon ship, to return home as ordered. Perhaps it was another of what you term my theatrical gestures, Mr. Booth, but I chose to remain aboard. You've lived out here for 20 years? Alone? 20 years? 20 Earth years, but I didn't live exactly alone. I've created companions of a sort. <laughs> they look a bit medieval, but I'm a romantic. We won't impose on your hospitality, Doctor. We can offer you the means of returning to Earth. What makes you think I want to return? The Cygnus is in danger of being destroyed here. Yes, your captain was worried about that too. But there's no cause for alarm. We developed anti-gravity forces to maintain our position. Doctor, this ship doesn't appear to be crippled. Of course not. We repaired the damage and became operable again. But you never obeyed the order to return to Earth. That's right. I refused this order. There were larger considerations. Other worlds yet to be explored. Life dreams unrealized. The authorities would still consider that an act of piracy, Doctor. 
What would you have said, Mr. Booth, if the authorities would have called back Columbus just before he discovered the new world? You wouldn't even exist. I'm about to prove to you that the end justifies the means. I'm on the brink of a great achievement. Come with me and I'll show you everything. While the Palomino crew toured the Cygnus, Harry Booth set off to explore the immense ship on his own. In the agricultural station, he came upon a single hooded robot working silently at a lighted control panel, completely oblivious of the reporter's presence. Quite a layout. I said it's quite a layout you got here. Can you speak? Are you programmed to speak? No, I guess not. No, I guess that'd make you a little bit too real, wouldn't it? Abruptly, the robot turned away from its post and walked off, much to Booth's amazement, with a very pronounced limp. In the meantime, Captain Holland had headed back to the Palomino to prepare for the remainder of the flight home. On his way, Captain Holland found himself in a huge cathedral-like chamber where a group of robots gently placed a still-covered form into a tube-like canister. As Holland watched, the robot stepped back in unison and the canister fired the figure out into space where it was picked up by the intense gravitational pull. It rushed off like a missile straight into the furnace of the black hole. Slowly and silently, the faceless robots returned to their duties. That evening, the Palomino crew joined Dr. Reinhardt for dinner. A toast to you and your companions, Dr. Durant, on the occasion of your visit to the Cygnus. The only Earth people to know of my existence. Tonight, my friends, we stand on the brink of a feat unparalleled in space exploration. If the data on my returning probe ship matches my computerized calculations, I will travel where no man has dared to go. Into the black hole? In, through, and beyond. Why, that's crazy. Ha! Impossible! The word impossible, Mr. Booth, has only found in a dictionary of fools. Your probe ship has only gone to the event horizon, Doctor, not into the black hole itself. How do you expect the Cygnus to escape being crushed by the force in there? I would assume that Dr. Reinhardt has created an anti-gravitational force field capable of withstanding that stress. Indeed, and I know you will say, Captain, that one mistake in navigation can be fatal. But I know exactly what I'm doing. The course I have chosen will take the Cygnus through at its optimum angle of rotation. The vortex will cause us to move at incredible speed. And that angle will slingshot us through. So, as I understand it, you want the Palomino to monitor your journey. That's right. I need you. You go to another place and another time. A place where I have the possibility to find what we call the ultimate knowledge. The probe ship is about to dock. Continue your meal, gentlemen. Cuckoo is a Swiss clock. What does your intuition tell you, Kate? that Dr. Reinhardt is walking a tightrope between genius and insanity. I think the guy's nuts. I don't buy that. Look, granted that 20 years out of contact with people has made this man a little eccentric. Tell him about the funeral, Dan. I don't know what they shot out into space, but they did it with all the reverence and honor of a human funeral. But you can't ask me to believe that he's programmed his robots to feel emotions come on. I know what I saw, Alex. And we only have Reinhardt's word for what happened to his crew. All I know is that that robot gardener was almost human, too. <laughs> Even walked to the limp. What spooks you about a malfunctioning robot, Harry? I wasn't spooked, old buddy. I'm just telling you that I had a gut feeling that, that I was looking at some kind of... some kind of person. What are you getting at? Now we make our apologies, say our goodbyes, and get off this ship as quick as we can. <laughs> 